Got your Bibles with you this morning. We're in the book of Romans. The book of Romans, chapter 13. The book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, as I was preparing my message uh, this week, um, the original thought that I had was all based upon trust and how we need to trust the Lord especially during these trying times that we're living in but the Holy Spirit was leading me a different way and every time I went back to trust the conviction grew stronger now this is what I want you to speak upon this week and so my message changed and I just pray that you would all be blessed this morning what the Lord has got for you. This is not my words, they're all from the Lord and we give him all the glory for his precious word to us this day. Amen. Father God, would you give you indeed all the glory and a few words. We thank you that your word brings us hope brings us encouragement, brings correction. And Lord, we just pray, as your message goes forward this morning, your people will be encouraged, they will be blessed, maybe corrected. Maybe, Lord, you would speak to them in areas of their life where they need to change. But Lord, we thank you for you. And I just pray now that you would use me, Lord, as a vessel for you. And I pray that your words would leave my mouth, that it be nothing of me but all of you this morning, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So commencing, Romans 13, verse 11. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed the night is nearly over the day is almost here so let us put aside the deeds of drunkenness and put on the armor of light let us behave decently as in the daytime not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. We pray the Lord will bless his word to us this morning. There was a priest and a pastor and they were standing by the side of the road holding up a sign that read the end is near turn around before it's too late well one speedy motorist took great offense at this and yelled out of his window leave us alone you religious nuts as he flew by and then from around the corner they heard screeching tires and a big splash <laughs> the pastor said to the priest do you think we should just put a sign up that says bridge out instead? <laughs> Today we talk about the end of this world as we know it. It is nearer than it has ever been before. Now the word Advent means coming. And we've just celebrated the coming of the Christ child at Christmas. But we should also remember that the risen Christ is coming for a second time. 
In fact, for every verse in the Bible prophesying about Jesus' first coming, there are eight that prophesy about his second coming. Long before Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jesus was the original I'll be back. In Revelation 22 verse 7, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hallelujah. And we can all say with the Apostle John, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Now in today's passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul writes with a sense of urgency. We need to be ready for Christ's return at any moment. But it could be today. It could be tomorrow. Billy Graham once said, we are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. We are to watch with anticipation. We are to work with zeal. And we are to prepare with urgency. The famous commentator Warren Wearsby summed up today's passage in three commands. Wake up, clean up and grow up. And it's these three points I want us to consider this morning. Wake up, Paul begins with an alarm clock analogy. He says in verse 11, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I am absolutely convinced that we are living in the end times. Do you know how I know this? Because any time between Jesus' ascension to heaven and his return from heaven is called the end times. No one knows how long this period of time will last, but it's all part of the end times. First century Christians believed that Jesus would return immediately. And when he didn't, some grew complacent and began to lose a sense of commitment to their faith. So Paul reminded them that they were ever nearer to their ultimate salvation, their heavenly home. Jesus told a parable with a similar theme. The parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13. In that story, ten virgins who today we might call bridesmaids, were waiting on the groom to arrive for the wedding. But they got drowsy after waiting all night. And finally, word came that he was on his way. But half the bridesmaids hadn't brought any lamp for their oil, their oils for their lamp, sorry. They tried to borrow from half that had, but they were told, we don't have enough for both Go and buy some more. By the time they did and returned, well, the wedding party had begun and they were locked out. The central point of the parable reflects the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. Because you'll never know when the groom will return for his bride. And scripture repeatedly refers to Jesus as the groom and the church as his bride. And the church, not this church necessarily, but the church as a whole, needs to wake up. It needs to arise from its slumber and get ready for the return of Christ. <coughs> Messages about the second coming of Jesus Christ are hardly heard in our churches today. Yet they are filled with messages that will tickle our ears, that will entertain us, that will make us feel good. Where is the passion and the zeal in the pulpits up and down Great Britain preaching that Christ is returning. That is our blessed hope. 
That's enough to get us out of bed each and every morning and throw back the curtains and look up and say, Lord, are you coming today? Are you coming back today, Lord? That's what should excite us. That's what should kickstart us every morning. That our redemption could be today. Hallelujah. He's coming back. Our second point, Paul says, church, clean up. We don't want to be found dirty when Christ returns. Paul describes the waiting period as night. You know, my mom used to say to me when I was in my teenage years, 16, 17, she used to say to me when I used to stay out late at night with my friends, Ah, uh, David, Nothing good happens downtown after midnight. Because she wanted me back home before midnight. For some strange reasons, after midnight then, all hell breaks loose in Walsall Town Centre or Birmingham, wherever I was, and my mum wanted me back home safely. Now Paul uses night and day, not just to illustrate periods of time, but also good and evil. In verse 12 he says, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. The last phrase, armour of light, suggests there is some protection in seeking to live godly lives. In verse 13, Paul gives us six examples of behaviour to avoid. He says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. There's a temptation here for everyone, even after one has sufficiently aged past the physical temptations of uh, debauchery, there remains those nasty internal Temptations of dissension and jealousy. So how do we clean up when we so easily return to our old temptations? We can all identify with Paul's words in Romans chapter 7. For I have, a desire, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do, no, I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Recurrent sin reminds us that we are powerless to change. So we can also say with Paul, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7.25 our only hope for change rests in our Saviour. And that leads us to part three, which is to grow up. Paul says, if you really want to clean up, you need to get rid of the old clothes that don't fit you anymore. And you need to put on new clothes appropriate to your new standing as a follower of Jesus Christ. Instead of trying to force ourselves into new habits, Paul says we should clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ himself and stop thinking about how to gratify all our other desires. If you seek to follow Christ, to truly put him first in your life, your desires for other less helpful things will diminish. Here, the goal is not to live perfect, sin-free lives, but to simply follow Jesus, to become more like him each and every day. Stop trying harder. Start trusting more. A Native American story speaks of two walls. One representing your good and wholesome self, 
The part of you that seeks to treat others respectfully, to encourage, to build up, to love. The second wolf represents your destructive evil self. The part of you that bites out with sarcasm and resentment and gossip, that tears down others and satisfies your own needs alone. A boy once asked his father, which wolf will get stronger and overpower the other in the battle for my life? And the father said, son, that's simple. It's the one you feed. As you follow Christ, you follow, you feed the good wolf within. Charles Stanley observes, we know we should avoid a certain place, but we go there anyway. We recognise a personal weakness for a particular activity, but we tempt ourselves anyway. How often do we fall into sin because we plan for it? To put on the Lord Jesus Christ carries the idea of making Jesus a part of everything you say and do. Like a comfortable piece of clothing that you wear all day, Jesus wants to join your decision-making processes. He wants to be Lord over your singleness or your marriage, over your career, your finances, your free time, over what you hear and what you watch. By the way you live, you reveal that either he is Lord of all or he is not Lord of all. The 3rd United States Infantry Regiment, known as the Old Guard, is the oldest active duty regiment in the US Army. It dates back to 1784. Its mission is to conduct memorial affairs to honour fallen comrades and ceremonies and special events to represent the US Army. One of its members, a lone sentinel, marches 21 steps forward and 21 steps back across the tomb of the unknown, symbolising the 21 gun salute given to a dignitary. Every 30 minutes, he's replaced with a new sentinel. Since 1930, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, Regardless of the weather, a guard has marched. Each one spends five hours a day preparing for this sacred duty. A former commander, a two-star general, Dan York, wrote about the old guard members in a recent devo devotional. He noted, an old guard must commit two years of life to guard the tomb. He will live in barracks under the tomb. He will swear not to drink any alcohol on or off duty, or to swear, use bad language in public for the rest of his life. He cannot disgrace the uniform or the tomb in any way. For the first six months, he cannot talk to anyone outside his unit, and he cannot watch television. All his off-duty time is spent studying the 175 notable people laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery. After two years, each guard receives a wreath pin to wear on his lapel, signifying his service as guard of the tomb. Only 400 people presently wear this pin. So long as members obey these rules, they may keep and wear the wreath. Now when I think of the old guard, I wonder what it might be like if we, as men and women, committed to fully to put on Christ daily. Imagine if we all swore off bad habits, foul language, daily studied scripture, 
to prepare for duty, faithfully worshipped God and honoured his name with our heart and our life. What if a cross was more than just a piece of pretty jewellery, but rather a sign of the highest honour, demanding faithfulness to the one who sent his son to bear that pain. Let us pray. Lord, help us to wake up, to clean up, to grow up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know we cannot do this on our own. We've tried and we have failed. Just when we think that we have this Christian life figured out, we fall again into temptation and sin. We all need your help to do it. Help us to put you first, to seek you first each day and throughout the day to allow your Holy Spirit to bring about the change in us, in your way. This new year, help us to eagerly look forward to Christ's return, to keep watch and to share the good news that Jesus is alive and that he is coming back for his church. And help us, Heavenly Father, as we seek to put on Christ our Lord daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all.